When you're shepherding potential, you're looking ahead, and we've been working hard at that. But once you raise the question about what do you bring with you as you move ahead, it stirs a tremendous amount of contest. What is it among our history? What is it within our practice? What is it within the structure and the ways that we have learned to live together that we carry with us into the wilderness? And how do we come to any consensus about that? I've long talked about this change culture as a journey into a new wilderness. And one of the things that's been very instructive to me is Walter Brueggemann, who has said that every single time the Israelites went into the wilderness or they went into the diaspora, whenever they had to leave home, they had to ask two questions again. How will we now be with God? And how will we now be with one another? And if you hear that question, it's a question about what do we take with us? And on the way, how do we restructure ourselves? And so Brueggemann talks about the fact that the Ten Commandments was a way in which it was a very fundamental way for the people to restructure themselves and to say, how will we now be with each other and with God? The Levitical Code in the Exodus, or in the, um, whatever the other one was. What, give me that one. <laughs> you all know that. Again, again, it was the same question. I think as we move ahead, we're faced again. And so Andrew is here as a Wesleyan among us to help us begin that conversation. So, Andrew. Thank you, sir. All right. I just now flipped this mic on. Is it on? Okay, good. Well, good evening. Good evening. The, um, the presentation that I'm here to give you tonight um, may be quite a bit less dynamic than uh, my... Um, my, my, my more dynamic predecessors have been up to this point, but I hope that it still works. I will say that um, when I speak in settings like this, I have the good fortune of addressing a subject matter uh, that is intrinsically interesting to Methodist folks, and that is uh, the thought of John Wesley, uh, Wesleyan theology, or more specifically, if we're talking about uh, the topic of the at hand tonight, the nature of the Wesleyan tradition and the challenges it has both been through and faces in the future. Now, um, speaking to a group of people who find what you're going to talk about intrinsically interesting anyway can be a real advantage um, in most ways. For instance, I don't usually have to try to win the room. Okay? I'm already on the winning side when I get up here. But in other ways, it can be a real disadvantage. Um, and I sometimes feel when I stand before a group of folks like you, that I'm almost like a living trope. I'm like the Wesley guy that gets trotted out to wave the banner um, and rally the troops, right? Um, well, I don't mind rallying the troops most times. I don't mind rallying the troops tonight. But doing so in this setting is going to require us to think very seriously and even critically about how poorly the troops have been trained for generations. <laughs> Only when we begin to do that work, I think, can we start to think about what it means to be trained better and to move forward more effectively into the future. So the story that I have to tell tonight is a story about traditions in conflict and in transition. And to enter into it, what I want to do first is to talk a little bit about what we mean by that word, tradition. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a definition that was articulated some years ago by the moral philosopher Alastair McIntyre in his work, Whose Justice, Which Rationality? And he offers a description of tradition that reads as follows. A tradition is an argument extended through time in which certain fundamental agreements are defined and redefined in terms of two kinds of conflict, those with critics and enemies external to the tradition, 
who reject all or at least key parts of those fundamental agreements, and those internal interpretive debates through which the meaning and rationale of the fundamental agreements come to be expressed and by whose progress a tradition is constituted. So a tradition, a socially embodied argument carried forward through time that is honed, defined, and redefined through types of conflict that are both external and internal to that tradition. Now the tradition that we are primarily concerned with here tonight is the... Thank you, the Wesleyan tradition, that's right. There will be no test after this is over, but it's good that you, it's good that you got that one. That's right, the Wesleyan tradition. The Wesleyan tradition is a tradition that arose historically within the evangelical and pietist wing of the Anglican spirituality of the first half of the 18th century. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Historically, that tradition has been marked by a few key tenets. <clears throat> a belief in the total depravity of human beings through sin, for one. The unlimited atonement of Jesus Christ through his sacrificial death on the cross, for a second. The universal availability of grace by virtue of that atonement, for a third. And the need for all people to personally receive God's saving grace in themselves, for a fourth. This tradition has also always held on to the tension between the nascent restoration of human moral faculties through the provenient character of God's grace, on the one hand, and still yet the profound need to encounter God's justifying grace and the new birth it mediates on the other. In addition, the Wesleyan tradition has given historically great attention to the sanctifying work of God's grace, which typically proceeds through individuals' engagement of the means of grace, practices which are themselves grounded not in individuals, but rather within the social character of the community of faith itself. The empirical fruits of sanctification are affectional in nature, meaning that they work on the affections of the human heart. They're often described with reference to the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. My daughter could teach you a great song uh, that will help you to remember all of those. In other words, the Christian believer, the Christian, excuse me, the Christian believer who is walking in holiness of heart and life is one in whom certain virtues are present, and those virtues are nameable. In some sense, those virtues are even measurable. In that sense, the Wesleyan tradition has always understood that sanctification is an empirical reality that can be beheld in human life and in human communities. Now, notice how, how much of what I've said here is related to the doctrine of salvation, right? In fact, everything that I've said here is related to the doctrine of salvation in a certain sense, although there's much to be said for a Wesleyan ethos of practical discipleship as well, especially when you engage the Wesleyan commitment to the practice of the means of grace. However, there are other aspects to the Wesleyan traditions that we must see also as central that are veer into other areas of systematic theology. One of these is a high Christology, which is connected, of course, to the meaning and power of Christ's atonement and the role of the Son of God in bringing salvation to all men and women. Another is a robust pneumatology, which is often seen at precisely those points where Wesleyans have spoken about and experienced present salvation in this world and in this life. Some of the best work in historical theology, indeed, around not only John Wesley's own thought, but around the practices of early Methodist communities right now, is being done with reference to how that thought and how those practices engaged the, their understanding of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, there is in the spirituality of the Wesleyan tradition a pointed concern for the well-being of the poor. This concern is connected to the command of Jesus Christ to care for the least of these and is linked as well to the view that present salvation is something that touches the body and soul together. In other words, salvation is 
a profoundly and inherently holistic reality. Now, all of this is simply to say, speaking historically anyway, that the Wesleyan tradition stands with what we would call evangelical orthodoxy in the Protestant sense. There are other nuances we could add to those that I've described above, but this gives us, historically at least, the main contours. That these contours had to be worked out through conflicts both external and internal, there can be no doubt. If you'll remember, those of you who have experience in seminary in your past, if you'll remember back to your Methodist history and doctrine courses, I think you'll recall some of these conflicts fairly easily. They're some of the more interesting stories within the history of early Methodism. Externally speaking, the evangelical revival arose right in the middle of the Enlightenment. And that meant that deism, as well as the philosophical exaltation of reason to almost divine status, were some of the forces that spurred on evangelical activity from the very beginning. And that's the case not just with the Methodist, but with the Congregationalist and the Presbyterian and the, the um, Anglican, meaning in the established church evangelicals in the 1830s, or excuse me, 1730s and 40s as well. The Institutional Church of England has to also be seen as an antagonistic outside force to the tradition as well. Though John Wesley and other evangelical leaders hoped to find institutional allies that would see their reforming work in a positive light, those were aspirations that were, by and large, unmet. It's also important to realize that within the Methodist movement itself, there were internal struggles and conflicts that were ongoing all of the time. The Wesleyans were just one branch of the Methodists. There were, of course, the Calvinistic Methodists as well, those who did not hold to an Arminian understanding of free grace and of election, but rather to a, to a Reformed understanding. And these, um, uh, these Methodist leaders were people like the Countess of Huntingdon, George Whitfield, Howell Harris, and others. Added to that major division internal to the tradition, there were other periodic tensions as well. We can think about a ready example in the perfectionist controversy, the London Blessing controversy of the late 1750s up to the mid-1760s, when the very meaning of Christian perfection itself, that most distinctive of all Wesleyan doctrines, became a source of turmoil for the early movement. In short... All of this is a way of saying that I think that Alice Dare McIntyre's description of what constitutes a tradition finds an ideal example in the tradition that we call Wesleyan. It is indeed an argument, that is, the Wesleyan tradition, about the nature of salvation and the nature of the Christian life, which is extended through time and in which certain agreements within the tradition have been defined and redefined in terms of conflicts, both internal and external to that tradition. Thus, the Wesleyan tradition has a foundation that can be described and has proven strong enough to provide the theological substance for church communities for well nigh 300 years. And yet, that tradition has not been and is not impervious to change. I mentioned a few of the conflicts that occurred in just the early years of the tradition's development. We could mention literally dozens of more that occurred from the foundation of the American church in 1784 up to the present. Now this description, McIntyre's definition of a tradition, is fairly thick. You need to work through it line by line. In an interesting way, though, think about how this description is written. And in an interesting way, one of the most prominent of the early Methodists penned a similar description with a much greater economy of verbiage. Charles Wesley from the hymn, And Are We Yet Alive? What troubles have we seen? What mighty conflicts past? Fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. It's a song written for Methodist preachers to be sung when they gather together for their annual conference every, every year. And it's very upfront, Charles Wesley is, about the reality that Wesleyan laborers in the vineyard have regularly encountered those internal and external conflicts that have contributed to make us what we are. But now we find that our tradition is in trouble. And to have some kind of clue about where we should go, we need to get a sense about how we got where we are. I want to offer up an account of that 
by talking about what happens when different traditions clash. Different traditions using tradition in that formal sense in which McIntyre speaks of it. It's a story that begins in the United States of America around the year 1820. Now, in many ways, the early American circuit riders mirrored their English counterparts in their approach to preaching, to spiritual practices, and to a commitment to pursue the salvation of all and sundry as their very modus operandi. Even if the context of the American frontier meant that they lost something of the theological sophistication around the doctrine of salvation that John Wesley himself, John Fletcher, and others had originally supplied. Yet in the period after about 1820, things began to change. As the historian John Wigger, who's a fine, very fine scholar at the University of Missouri, has traced in his excellent, excellent study, Taking Heaven by Storm, um, a book that I believe is still in print and in paperback that I would recommend to you all. Instead of being contented with preaching and practicing a dramatically countercultural vision of the Christian gospel, which included a robust commitment to the practice of the means of grace as the pattern of discipleship and the central significance of the small group spirituality known in classes and bands, all of which were things that they had remained committed to up to that point, Methodist preachers and laity alike began to be more and more concerned about such worldly concerns as upward mobility and social respectability. One example of this change comes to us from an incident in Ithaca, New York in the mid-1820s. It seems that rural New York Methodists in the outlying areas around Ithaca had planned a camp meeting. Now, that may sound like that would, that's almost a sentimental thing, kind of thing for us, but you have to remember, 1824, 1825, camp meetings are barely over 20 years old. Okay? This is still a relatively new phenomenon and certainly a, a very vital form of, of spirituality. The town Methodists in Ithaca, though, had a problem with this. They were uncomfortable with what they suspected the spirituality of the gathering would prove to be. One layman in the congregation in Ithaca a man named David Ayers, lamented that the town Methodists could not prevent the camp meeting from being held entirely. And if it had been up to Brother Ayers, he sort of shut the thing down. And Ayers lamented that the town Methodists, um, the town Methodists in some ways could not be stopped from going out to visit with their country cousins if they so chose. And so he recommended to the powers that be in the Methodist church in town in Ithaca that the members of their congregation should be encouraged in every way to keep a respectful distance from the goings-on out in the country. Ayers even proposed that Ithaca Methodists might think about holding their own prayer meeting in town, separate from the camp meeting, that members of the congregation in Ithaca would be encouraged to attend. Thus, said Ayers, and this is a quote, thus, if the Methodists from the country become disorderly, we will not suffer as the public can see the difference between the Ithaca Methodists and the ranting Methodists from the country, end quote. Now, we could play with this incident quite a bit and tease out the ways in which there are clearly divisions ongoing in those parts around, in and around Ithaca, New York. Certainly, there is a town and country tension. I mean, that is right there on the surface between the relatively urban Ithacans and, as Ayers puts it, the ranting Methodists from the country. <laughs> Connected to this division is surely a socioeconomic division and most likely an educational one as well, with the Methodists in the city both more prosperous and better educated than their country counterparts. Another way we can interpret this episode, though, and one that I would encourage us to think about right now, is as a competing set of underlying traditions. What we have going on here is really, in some ways, the collision of two traditions, where the elements of geography, you know, rural versus urban, wealth and education are simply symptoms of something larger, something that underlies all of them. On the one hand, there is the older Wesleyan spiritual tradition represented by the country Methodists with its focus on a dynamic openness to the action of the Holy Spirit. 
a devotion to a form of practice that gave priority to spiritual experience or a connection with God over social respectability. A commitment to a thoroughgoing social holiness in the Wesleyan sense of that term, meaning the community itself existing as a means of grace and all those members of the community heeding the call to, in Wesley's own words, to watch over one another in love. And also a commitment to an honest-to-God belief, a real belief in the evangelical doctrine of salvation. All of those things, by the way, that I just mentioned, all of those things are things that in one form or another would have been present in the three- to four-day experience of the camp meeting itself. On the other hand, there is an enlightenment-fueled American civil tradition represented by the Ithaca Methodists, represented by David Ayers and his confreres, that is tied to certain beliefs about the importance of middle-class prosperity, of advanced education, and of appropriate decorum and political citizenship. This second tradition is, it should be admitted, is not unfriendly to tradition. Excuse me, it's not unfriendly to religion. After all, what does heirs propose be done? A prayer meeting be held, right? A competing sort of gathering that would have the appropriate uh, kind of decorum would be done in the right way, at the right place, and at the right time. So it's not unfriendly to religion, but it's certainly determined to domesticate it and to put it in the service of what it understands to be its own larger purposes. What we have here, in other words, is the maturing, indeed the challenge, I would suggest, of the Enlightenment tradition in its American guise through the economic milieu of capitalism, that's where the um, emphasis on the appropriate levels of kind of wealth, advancement, and respectability come in, and the philosophical ascendancy of liberal individualism, about which I'll have more to say in a moment. The latter of these two traditions, that is the Enlightenment tradition of liberal individualism, that's the tradition that's going to win out over time. It's the tradition which is in many ways the, the water in which we're all swimming right now. But the former, that is the Wesleyan tradition, is not going to go down without a fight. Wigger, the historian, goes on to cite other examples of what happened to the Wesleyan spirituality that Methodist folk originally embraced in the 1820s and in subsequent years. The ongoing changes from the, about 1820 to the 1850s were clearly noticed by the people at the time. I mean, they weren't unaware of the changes that were going on all around them, the changing values in many ways. The Methodist preachers who remained devoted to the old ways became known as, you remember this? Croakers. They became known as croakers, the word evoking the sound that a, that a bullfrog that is determined to hang out on the edges of the swamp, right, never come into civilization, uh, is wont to make. The croakers could be annoying to their more, they were annoying to their more sophisticated brethren, but they were nothing if not prescient about the effects of the transformation that were taking place in their world and in their tradition all around them. Charles Giles, one such croaker, believed that one of the greatest sources of decline in the power of Methodist preaching was a growing tendency for Methodist preachers to read their sermons word for word from a manuscript. I say as I'm reading word for word from a manuscript. Not preaching, though. This practice, which their more sophisticated city-dwelling Methodists appreciated, verbally appreciated, there are records of them appreciating it as a mark of erudition, right? I mean, if you're relying on a written-out manuscript, that's a sign that you have studied. And if, it's stu if you're studying in order to preach, that means that you are relying on, on a kind of an erudition, a kind of an education that you devoted time to that is appropriate to increasingly big steeple churches. Now, all of this was lamented by Charles Giles, who said the following. Quote, if Methodist ministers become disgusted with zealous preaching and plain dealing, if they trust in their literary requirements and seek for fame, wealth, and popularity, they will lose all their secret strength and become weak as Samson, shorn of his locks. End quote. Giles went on, quote, 
Reading sermons will never convert sinners, will not produce reformations, and will not carry on the work of religious revivals, end quote. Another preacher devoted to the old ways, a man named Abner Chase, sounded a similar concern. He wrote, quote, There is a greater effort now being made to please the ear than to reach the heart and to bring them to the foot of the cross. The sword of the Spirit being muffled with silken wreaths cannot penetrate the coat of mail with which sinners are clad, end quote. While preachers tended to lament changes in preaching itself on a frequent basis, it's notable that other changes ongoing during the same time period mirrored those changes of homiletical content and approach. These changes included a sharply diminished commitment to the itineracy, preachers pining away, bothering their presiding elders and bishops about longer and longer tenures, complaints about the decline of the camp meeting itself, uh, which was being uh, transformed into as much a sentimental ritual by mid to late 19th century uh, as, as it was anything. A decline also of the class meeting as well as the love feast. Uh, venerable Methodist institutions that had once uh, uh, carried a, a, a very important role in allowing laity, the kind of spiritual empowerment, to testify, to be able to speak uh, publicly. And this included women in ways that women were often not allowed to speak. Um, uh, the love feast and the, and the class meeting itself had, were developing into a form that made them in many ways unrecognizable to um, their late 18th century predecessors. John Wigger's conclusion about the fate of American Methodism as a distinctive tradition is telling. This is what he writes. As large numbers of American Methodists became well entrenched in American society, they transformed their church from a counterculture to a subculture of American society. By mid-century, both the church and its constituency had largely become a part of America's predominant culture. In the process, much of what had been distinctive about the early Methodist movement was jettisoned, end quote. Now, note some of the interesting facets of what I have just described and what followed historically. First of all, the tradition of Enlightenment liberal individualism more or less won out. It's still winning out. I'm not even sure if that's a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing. As I said, it's just the water in which we swim. But that doesn't mean that Methodist folk went away, of course. It doesn't even mean that the Wesleyan tradition completely went away. It does mean, though, that at those points where the two traditions claimed the same ground, at that point where the Enlightenment tradition of individualism and the Wesleyan tradition were staking claims to the same parts of people's lives, the claims of the Wesleyan tradition upon human life were essentially hollowed out. They were, ironically, left in form but not in power, which was the very thing that John Wesley himself warned uh, would be the death knell of Methodism. That's what happened amongst the ruling classes, at least, amongst the ruling classes, amongst the predominantly white, uh, mostly urban, and, and educated classes. In the second half of the 19th century, in the first half of the 20th century, the places where you see an authentic and vibrant Wesleyan spirituality are largely amongst people who were politically and socioeconomically marginalized. Very interesting. This is, in other words, black Methodism and the holiness movement. I mean, that's where you see the, the most authentic aspects of Wesleyanism persisting. But why did it happen this way? The answer has something to do with what I said a moment ago about the fact that the two traditions claimed the same ground. Alistair McIntyre points out that there is a characteristic tendency for what happens when two intellectual traditions confront one another in this way. In other words, when there's a, a collision uh, between traditions. Namely, there is, this is McIntyre's words, there is no neutral way of characterizing either the subject matter about which they give rival accounts or the standards by which their claims are to be evaluated. 
In other words, there's no neutral third ground. It's not like Enlightenment liberal individualism, the Western tradition, can put down their swords and say, you know what, let's go to an arbitrator. Let's go to a neutral third language or a neutral third vocabulary as a way to work out our differences. No, rather what happens is that the one tradition judges its opponent from the standards of its own rationality, its own vocabulary, its own thought processes, its own, its own internal set of goods, and the other tradition does the exact same thing. That is, from within a given tradition, there is an accepted standard for what constitutes truth, for what constitutes goodness, for what constitutes the, the telos towards which all human endeavor should point, right? I mean, all of this stuff has already been worked out in any tradition that it has developed to any degree. And what this means, in short, is that there is a form of rationality within a given tradition that may be and likely is utterly unintelligible from within a competing tradition. In McIntyre's analysis... The tendency of traditions in conflict is for each tradition to, again his words, for each tradition to characterize the contentions of its rivals on its own terms, not on its rivals' terms, but on its own terms, making explicit the grounds for rejecting what is incompatible with its own central theses, although sometimes allowing that from its own point of view and in light of its own standards of judgment, uh, it has, the other has something to teach in a marginal and subordinate way. If you take that to the example of the Ithaca Methodists, what you have to understand is that David Ayers was representing the Enlightenment tradition, and when he was referring to those ranting Methodists from the country, he was referring to an aspect of Wesleyanism that he had implicitly already decided to reject. And so it was an aspect of Wesleyan spirituality that was no longer intelligible to him. It no longer made sense that Methodists would get together in a camp meeting and would experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to the point where they would describe it using words like melting. We had a great melting time. That's a phrase that you see in early American Methodist preachers' journals. The Spirit came upon us and we melted, that sort of thing. Uh, it no longer made sense to him that, that good-thinking people that, that upstanding citizens of his community would get together in a gathering where people would experience psychosocial phenomena that went by the names of things like the yips, the barks, the shouts, and the jerks. Now, within that early Wesleyan tradition, that stuff was actually rational, right? I mean, it was, not, it was rational. People knew it was expected. That was the sort of thing, that was the sort of spirituality that obtained when people got together, heard the gospel preached, and experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But it did not make sense at all. It was irrational. It was in many ways unintelligible if you were standing outside of that tradition and it within the, the ascendant tradition of the day. Now, in other words, all of this is to say, traditions have a very difficult time, a very difficult time indeed engaging one another because there is no neutral third ground. Think about how this bears out in what we've just been talking about. The Wesleyan tradition historically was a tradition that emphasized the guilt and debilitation of sin. It emphasized the universal availability of God's grace. It emphasized the need for a conversion experience or for new birth in the Holy Spirit. And it emphasized the calling to live a holy life as patterned by the means of grace. And of course, within the community provided by the Methodist society and more particularly by the class meeting. Now, I'm using those examples in a very specific sort of way because they refer not only to the practices that Methodist folk, that Wesleyan folk engaged in, but they refer to the vocabulary that made those practices make sense, right? It's the things that people were doing, but it's actually the operative concepts that were going on in people's minds that they believe pointed to something that was true and real. Now, the American version of Enlightenment liberal individualism, on the other hand, historically has emphasized moral autonomy over against an outdated um, superstitious notion like original sin. You understand I'm using that in scare quotes. It has emphasized, historically, the universal availability of upward mobility. 
over against the need for forgiving and healing grace. It has emphasized the need, the deep and profound need for self-actualization over against something that is so external and contingent upon the mercy of God as conversion. And it has emphasized the calling to live a prosperous life and a flourishing life through economic, educational, and political attainments over against a flourishing life as patterned by the means of grace. What I'm suggesting here is that this Enlightenment tradition won out over the Wesleyan tradition in which Methodism was originally rooted. And the question I would think those of us in this room would want to ask is, why did that happen? Why did it happen? We are familiar, are we not, with the rich spiritual power and depth of our own tradition? It's compelling. So why in the world would 19th century Methodists who were raised in the midst of that tradition, who didn't have to study it until they could understand it the way many of us did, but they were, they were raised in it. They were in the midst of it. It was their milieu. Why, having been raised in that way, would they ever want to leave it? And more than that, why would they be so embarrassed as to utterly domesticate the spirituality it engendered until Methodism itself became, by and large, a watered-down, almost civil American religion? A key point to recognize here is the nature of Enlightenment individualism itself. And I really, do, I really do believe this holds a key. In a very real sense, we can't begin to understand Wesleyanism's decline, much less speak intelligibly about the future of the Wesleyan tradition, without coming to grips with the degree to which the recent history of the West has been largely about freeing ourselves from tradition. Okay? That's what all this stuff about liberal individualism is about. It's about having liberty. It's about having individual choice. It's about being able to kind of emerge um, uh, uh, from the womb a fully formed human being, kind of ready to make your contributions, kind of no assembly required, no formation required. A recent Christianity Today article refers to, quote, the West's long process of emancipating the individual from all authority outside the sovereign self. Self there being written in capital letters. Liberal individualism is about freeing the individual from outside constraints, from legal restrictions, and yes, of course, from the weight of inherited tradition. In that sense, ironically, it is a tradition whose primary value is to reject tradition in favor of the free, self-actualized, and autonomous self. And in the midst of all that, and in the light of all that, what possible role? Could a belief in sinful brokenness, conversion, and accountable submission to a faith community have? Well, Jason Vickers, another very fine scholar who, who until recently was at United Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, is now at the Memphis campus of uh, Asbury Seminary, uh, recently penned the opening essay to the Cambridge Companion to American Methodism under this title, American Methodism. A theological tradition. <laughs> it's a very aspirational title, okay? <laughs> After laboring for 25 pages trying to articulate how American Methodism actually constitutes a tradition, the best Vickers can come up with is to speak about uh, uh, that tradition in what he calls five languages. Now, uh, just so you know, the languages are evangelicalism, radicalism, meaning political radicalism, ecumenism, liberalism, and Wesleyanism. If we were to compare the kind of terminology that Vickers uses with the way in which a thinker like McIntyre defines what a tradition is, we might come to the conclusion that Vickers' own word choice betrays his inability to prove his case. I mean, after all, if a tradition is an argument, a socially embodied argument that's carried through time, then for that argument to obtain, for the, there to be the kind of coherent agreement that McIntyre says a tradition consists of, wouldn't you think that the people within the argument have to be speaking the same language to one another, right? There has to be a kind of a mutual intelligibility between them. 
Granted, Vickers is using the term language in, meta in a metaphorical sense, but it's telling nonetheless that the metaphor evokes an image something like the Tower of Babel. Also notable about Vickers' conclusion is that Wesleyanism, his word, is but one of the five languages that contributes to what he considers to be the American Methodist tradition. Now, that's the one I came here to talk about today. I came here to talk about Wesleyanism, or rather the Wesleyan tradition. And I think that Vickers is absolutely correct in asserting that the Wesleyan tradition and the Methodist tradition in its American context are not identical terms. It's very important to get down. The Wesleyan tradition and the American Methodist tradition, or American Methodism generally, are not the same thing, okay? It's very important for us to remember that. I could have come here tonight to, talk, to speak to you about American Methodism, but this is, after all, the forum on Wesleyan potential. And that's the term that the Texas Methodist Foundation and the South Central Jurisdiction College of Bishops chose. They did not choose the title Forum on American Methodist Potential. It might be worth us thinking about what implicit commitments we're making by the very words that we use to describe the gathering that we're a part of right now. Though Jason Vickers himself might object to this, I think one of the ways in which we can put his historical analysis to use is in thinking about what we mean by Wesleyan tradition when we use the term. Ultimately, we want to employ those strategies and techniques in ministry that lead to some realized good. What is that good? You might describe it as making disciples for Jesus Christ, right? Or fostering vital Christian communities. You might call it simply transforming lives in the name of Jesus. I could get on board with that. Or whatever. But we'll be wasting our time if we employ strategies and techniques that are attempts to move us into the future if we do not understand what we mean by Wesleyan tradition. In other words, if we don't have a common vision. That is to say, we'll be wasting our times if we employ those strategies and techniques in a way that amounts to throwing everything possible we can find against the wall to see what sticks. Might be the case that over the most of the course of its almost 50 years of existence, that's what the United Methodist Church has been doing. This is what will help us, getting clear, that is to say, about the vision from which we're working, the meaning of the term, the nature of the tradition, is what will help us move from belief to practice effectively. I would suggest that only by gaining some coherence around vision, only by gaining some coherence within the inner life of the tradition, can we make the development of strategy and the execution of technique worthwhile. Doing this important work around our vision, the Wesleyan vision, entails us recognizing that there is a lot of chaff in our theological wheat. It means recognizing what we're up against as well. After all, the heyday of Enlightenment individualism has not ended. Indeed, we may be in the heyday of its heyday. And the survival of the Wesleyan tradition is, of course, no sure thing. I want to end tonight with two quotations. The first is from the prominent and provocative Methodist theologian, Billy Abraham. <laughs> I'm in Billy Abraham territory down here, I know. A few years ago, Abraham wrote an article for the Wesleyan Theological Journal entitled, The End of Wesleyan Theology where he argued that a distinctive Wesleyan tradition was, for all intents and purposes, finished. Here's Abraham. Where there was once a time when there existed a relatively coherent set of ideas and correlative practices, these have now collapsed and been replaced by competing alternatives. The great hymns are no longer sung. The fervent sacramentalism has been eroded. The robust orthodoxy has been undermined. The commitment to the poor has become a normative ideology. The evangelistic fervor has been sidelined. The biblical literacy has been lost. The official canonical doctrines of new birth, assurance, perfection, and predestination are unknown or received with consternation. What we have are bits and pieces of the tradition grafted into theological visions that have their roots elsewhere. As a serious experiment in theology, Wesleyanism is over. Tough words. The whole essay is worth reading. I commend it to you as well. And it's also worth pointing out that Billy is no predestinarian. 
he still lives very much as a Wesleyan. And I suspect he believes that a Wesleyan revival is certainly within the realm of possibility. But it's difficult to deny, to deny that in most of that description up on the screen, he's describing true events, things that have happened. Now, the second quote I want to share is shorter. And it comes from an account that John Wesley once gave to describe um, the, the birth and the progress of the Methodist revival in England. This is what Wesley writes. This comes from the large minutes. In 1729, two young men reading the Bible saw they could not be saved without holiness, followed after it, and incited others so to do. In 1737, he's writing that in retrospect, he means 1738. In 1737-38, they saw that holiness comes by faith. They saw likewise that men are justified before they are sanctified. But still, holiness was their point. God then thrust them out, utterly against their will, to raise a holy people. Now note the way that the word holiness is being used here. We cannot be saved without holiness. Holiness comes by faith. There is a certain logic to justification and sanctification, yes, but it all eventuates in holiness. And when one comes to understand these things, the only relevant response is what? Well, it is to go out into the world to raise a holy people. Now, Wesley believed that biblical holiness was a synonym for Christian love. It is that thing God gives us and not something we conjure up ourselves. And when it is given to us, and when we receive it rightly, it forms us into a holy community, that is to say, a community of love, which becomes the very light of the world. Traditions arise, develop, decline, and dissipate. Yet certain truths never go away. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will endure forever. Here's the good news. When contingent traditions are animated by truths that endure, their renewal is never outside the realm of possibility. Thank you. Supposed to finish by 8.15, and it's 8.14, so that's better than I would usually do. Uh, we have just a few minutes for questions if anyone uh, would like to ask one, or comments for the good of the body. Andrew? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was meeting at a church just a couple of days ago, and, um, and uh, a member of our staff, we were talking about, we're, we're going through a visioning process for the church. And uh, we were talking about what, we have a mission statement, it's great. It's very succinct, uh, it's memorable, um, we're teaching it to our people. And, um, but but the, we're asking the question now, um, what, if, we're, if this is our mission, if this statement is our mission, then, then what is that vision projected outward that we are trying to move towards, right? Uh, it's never really been fully articulated at our church. And so we were talking about that in a meeting uh, of, of a task force that we have to deal with this the other night. And one of our staff members said, um, we're using, using the language of transformation, of being a kind of a presence in our community, of hoping to aim towards a certain 
you know, goal for who we are and who, who our city would be. And one of our staff members said, and we need to take all of that and put it in language that people can understand. We don't need to expect them to be able to speak our language. And that is, in a very important sense, true. But in another important sense, it's very misleading. Okay? Uh, if, you were going to, if you were going to set out to become fluent in French, would you go about studying the French language by going to your teacher or to your tutor and saying, can't you just put that French in language that I understand, right? Um, well, the answer is that's ludicrous. Um, we would say the same thing about people who are studying mechanical engineering or people who are studying medicine or people who are studying law, right? Um, do you want to go to a, a cardiologist for your heart health who, who only ever learned cardiology in language that the layman can understand? Of course you don't. You would never submit yourself to that person's medical care, right? All that is to say is that being initiated into a community, whether that's an academic community, whether it's a linguistic community, or whether it's a faith community, involves a process of formation. And part of that formation is necessarily catechetical, right? Um, so that to say that we only put things in language that people can understand is a way of saying we don't believe what our community or what our tradition actually has claimed historically to believe, right? Why don't we rather say um, we, we practice that kind of relational evangelism that is able to initiate people into our community so that the language they learn is the language of the faith? Now, Wesleyans historically were great at this. And you know how they did it? Through hymnody. People learned their faith through hymnody. You go in Methodist churches today and you look out and nobody's singing. It's the saddest thing in the world, right? Um, people don't learn music anymore either. But historically, that's the, that's, that was the role of the Methodist hymnal. It was the counterpart, frankly, to the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. It was our Book of Common Prayer, except it had notes in it, you know? Um, it's a roundabout way of trying to answer your question, Andrew, but I, I think it, what, what McIntyre is talking about in out After Virtue is that we all kind of act, react, and speak from a kind of a motivist standpoint. Uh, we, we no longer have the capacity to use a kind of a practical rationality that is agreed upon within our common culture. And as a result, all I have is me. So every statement that I put out there is a statement of my own self-worth. And therefore, if you contradict me or argue uh, with me, we're not arguing about, uh, about an idea. We're, you're argue, everything becomes a, a, um, a personal statement, right? Um, it's, one, it's a huge problem culturally. Bishop. If we take McIntyre's definition of tradition, do you agree with Billy Abraham that the Wesleyan tradition is dead? So I grew up real close to the St. Francis River <laughs> in northeast Arkansas. And it's not a river you'd ever want to swim in, but the best catfish you're ever going to catch come out of that river. It's, it's, it's okay for them. It's really muddy, brackish water, right? Nothing's really clear cut in the St. Francis. But it is an environment in which certain kinds of creatures can thrive, right? I mean, when it comes to talking about the way in which traditions exist, they don't, it, it's, it's not like, you know, it's not like we're on a six-lane highway and every tradition keeps to its lane. They're always overlapping each other and jostling with each other and fighting with each other all of the time. I don't think that Billy actually believes what he says because I don't think he would have bothered to write the essay if he did. And I don't think that Billy would continue, that, that essay is almost 10 years old now. In fact, it may be over 10 years old. He wouldn't have continued to do the kind of work that he's done, right? Um, uh, he is a good friend of yours, I know. He's a, he's a, he, Billy is a provocateur in the best sense. Um, he's wanting to get us to have conversations like this one right here. Um, uh, dead, no. On life support, I don't know. In need of serious revitalization, yeah. I mean, we need, need to dig a, a ditch around that sucker and fill the ditch with manure and, and see what God will do. Um, it's ultimately going to be God who renews that tree if it's going to be renewed, but we've got to get to work you know, digging the ditch and filling it with manure. I think that works. <laughs> <laughs>
are now in the first Rome wave. So it seems to me that we have three different voices or traditions, three enlightenment, enlightenment and whatever this view is. And, and I think in part of my brain that I'm hearing you <coughs> argue in favor of returning to a true enlightenment articulation of what is Taoism. Impossible. Okay. Then what? Can't get the toothpaste back in the tube. So is it not better for everyone concerned to simply say, love you, you go live over there, I'm going to come live over here, um, and, and the ways are tolerated? Mm -hmm. I will, I will say, just one second, I, I will say I don't know, I'm not convinced that there is such a thing as a post-enlightenment era that we're living in. I don't, I would have to know more what you mean when you say that. Um, uh, the thing I would simply say is this, um, there, adhering to and living within a tradition is a viable option, any tradition, right, um, uh, is a viable option for us today. And I think it's worth us asking why is it that the dominant tradition, the dominant kind of thought world that defines most of the kinds of choices that people make that have to do with... Um, the political environment, but also the economic, the technological and cultural environment that we're living in right now. Why is that so compelling to people? Is it simply because they haven't been confronted with something more winsome? They haven't been confronted with something more life-giving? They haven't been confronted with something more vital, right? And, 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 and if they haven't been, and we think that the Wesleyan tradition is that, then why aren't we offering that to people? If, if we do... And it, and, it is, and it is not able to be compelling to people, then that ought to tell us something. It ought to be it probably at that point time to start closing up shop. Yeah. I just, I'm just not convinced that we've offered it yet. Beyond what's in the program? What you would most have us remember from this program is. Mm -hmm. What is that? I would refer you to the program. I mean, that's what I submitted for that. Um, if you want me to try to say it, I, I don't have it. Simply? Yeah. I think it's fairly simple in the program. Um, uh, what I would suggest is we, we, need to, we need to open our eyes and be aware that the conflicts that are ongoing around us have a history to them. I mean, I was telling what, what, what you would call a declension narrative, a declension narrative, meaning I was giving you an account of the decline of a thing, and that thing is the Western tradition as we understand it. So we need to understand that the challenges that we have, they're not new. They didn't start yesterday. They didn't start 10 years ago. They have a history to them, okay? So in that sense, that ought to be encouraging in some ways. It ought to also give us the kinds of clues for the kinds of things that we need to be about in order to move forward. None of us know our history well enough to understand how we're going to move into the future. We've got to know who we are, all right? And that involves a process of intellectual and spiritual formation. Now, if we do that and we do it well, I believe that it will in and of itself be part of that work of equipping the saints for the work of ministry because we'll be able to speak the truth that God has given us going back, as I said, almost 300 years in a way that is relevant and comprehensible to people today. People are no less hurting and they're no less hungry now than they ever were. We're just not very effective at communicating the gospel that God has given us that can actually be the, the balm of Gilead that they need. 
Yeah. Uh huh. And so we just don't know how to define what great is to any of us. We just know it's great. Yeah. Well, so let, to be specific, what I what I said was that if you wanted in the in the in the nineteenth and early twentieth centuries, if you wanted to see authentic Wesleyan spirituality, you needed to go to one of the black Methodist denominations, the AME, the AMEZ, or the CME Church, or you needed to look in the holiness movement, the Free Methodist Church, the Wesleyan Methodist Connection, et cetera. Okay? Um, now, it, it, it wasn't that... I mean, part of it is the history of, of why those groups separated and when they separated. In 1784 at the Christmas Conference, written into the first minutes, the first version of our Book of Discipline, there was a very strict... Uh, 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 minute that said that um, that slaveholding Methodists were a contradiction in terms, and that slaveholding Methodists had to emancipate their bondsmen by a certain period of time, and they, they had a whole structure about when these these enslaved persons, were, how old they were, and when, you know how long you had to release them. And if you weren't, you're were going to be excommunicated. And if you were a slave trader, meaning that meaning if you were someone who perpetuated the economy of slavery, you were out automatically. All right. That was 1784. Okay. Within 10 years, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were being run out of St. George's Church in Philadelphia because they, they, um, they had the audacity to go down on the bottom floor and, and try to pray with, with white worshipers. I mean, within 10 years, that quick, right? You look at the holiness movement, and it was, you know, the different groups that separated over the course of the 19th century were over all kinds of different things. Uh, one of them, Casper, was over pew rents. I mean, the free Methodists, part of what was free, they were free of slavery, they were free of a lot of things, but they were free of pew rents. It was a very important thing, because what you do when you allow pew rents is you allow socioeconomic stratification, right? Um, but, of course, the biggest issue of all for the, for the holiness folk was the, was the very doctrine of sanctification itself, and for some of them entire, most of them, entire sanctification or Christian perfection. In other words, they were groups that were attempting to hold on to what they understood to be vital aspects of Wesleyan doctrine and practice in the face of a, of a broader church, the Methodist Episcopal Church, that was becoming more and more worldly by the day. You stop there? Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, nope.